today I'm with Margaret Laws Ingalls, a longtime resident of the Eastern Shore, born in 1911, a longtime teacher in Snow Hill, and one of the early attendees of the Salisbury Normal School back in the late 1920s. And so, welcome. Today, what I'd like to do is ask some questions about your childhood and growing up on the Eastern Shore and some of your, your work experiences as well. So can you talk a little bit about your family and, and where you're from here in Wicomico County? Yes, uh, I was born in uh, Salisbury, Maryland, and I lived here on Camden Avenue in a big house um, until I was uh, in the fifth grade. I went to a cons consolidated school, Camden School, and I went here until the fifth grade, and at, the, at that time, when I was 11 years old, I moved out to the farm in Wango, and the farm has been has been owned all, all the all my life by the Laws family, but it was ten, had tenants in it at that time. The tenants moved out, and we moved from Camden into the country. Now we had been in a home with central heating, gas to cook with, everything a wraparound porch, a beautiful home. We moved out to the country and had nothing. Hmm. We had no indoor uh, water. We had a pump, a pitcher pump on the back porch, a privy outside, no central heating, just wood stoves burning in every room. My goodness, what did you think of that as an 11-year-old? Well, I was a little, you know, flabbergasted, <laughs> I would say. Then I had to go to a one-room school in Wango. Mm -hmm. Now, Wango then, was a, uh, a little community with a school, a post office, a mill, a church, uh, quite a few houses, and uh, it was, it's different now. It has, all that has passed away, and there, I think the church still remains. But anyway, I went to a one-room school, which was so different. It was one room with a pot belly stove in the middle, and uh, if you sat near the stove, you, you roasted. If you sat away from the stove, you froze. And there were 32 children in the school. And uh, I was not considered a very uh, good person to have in the school. They, you know, they kind of ignored me a little bit. Why? Well, I was, uh, uh, quotation marks, city girl, I guess, to them, because <laughs> this was real country. But I managed to stay there and get through the seventh grade there. And at the seventh grade, that was the end of the one-room school, I had to go to Salisbury. So there was no bus then that took 12 miles, took me 12 miles there. So I had to board with a relative. And I boarded from, well, for four years, from seven to 11th grade, no 12th grade then. And then I went to from 29 to 31, I went to normal school. Okay. So now, now so, so when you moved out to Wongo, that would have been, you said, I think, fifth grade? Uh-huh. So and had... it was 1922 when we moved out there. I had my maternal grandmother, my paternal grandfather, my father, my mother, my two-and-a-half-year-old brother, and me were the ones that moved out there. Wow, and so when you moved out, you moved into your family's old house. That's right, that had been tenanted, and, and we moved back to the farm from Salisbury. Okay, now we've got some photographs of that house that were taken, I think, in the 1990s. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about the house? Well, the house had, uh, was built by my grandfather. It had three floors, no basement, but three floors, 13 rooms, two bathrooms, and it was a, a lovely house. 13 rooms? 13 rooms. My grandfather had two families, two wives, six children with each wife. Not and at so the same they, time, these two wives. No, not, <laughs> not really. Yes. But um, uh, the house grew as a family grew, mm -hmm. and so it was a, a big house. And the house had then been built in the mid-1800s? Uh, uh, 1850s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was, the house was then surrounded by some farmland. Oh yes, a lot of farmland. Okay. It was an original grant from England in the 1700s. 
and was always owned by the Laws family. Since the 1700s, the Laws yes. family lived there and, and worked that land. Yeah. When you moved out in the 18, or rather in 1922, you said? I moved out 22. What sorts of crops did you grow then? Uh, corn. I think it was mostly corn and, and truck um, uh, vegetables and things like that. Okay, so did you grow like strawberries and tomatoes? Oh, yes. Or? Strawberries, cucumbers, uh, white potatoes, sweet potatoes, uh, melons. And we grew everything, but mostly corn. Okay. And did you have uh, a couple of tenant families that worked with you on the farm? Yes. We had two tenant houses and two tenant families, and they worked on the farm with my father. We had um, um, uh, lots of animals. We had two horses, two mules, and of course there was no mechanized uh, farm equipment then. You just used cultivators or uh, plows behind horses or mules. Hmm. We had um, cows, we had uh, a bull, we had um, turkeys, guineas, chickens, pigs, um, I said turkeys, um, that, that's quite uh, a few. kittens, ca uh, cats, and a, a collie dog. Yep. Was the collie dog for the family or for work? Well, it was for the family, and he also helped to get the cows up okay. from the pasture. Mm. And I used to go with him, and the bull was named Mayflower. <laughs> Isn't that a lovely name? That is a great name for a bull. <laughs> and and uh, he was uh, quite vicious, but he was so scared of our collie. The collie would get right at his heels and nip, and so my father never felt bad about sending me out to get the cows up. Mm. And the collie would do the work and you would and just the make collie, sure? And the collie, yeah. The collie would round them up. Mm. Now, what other sorts of work did you have to do on the farm? Oh my right? goodness. We picked strawberries. We picked cucumbers. We bugged potatoes. Now, What does I, that mean? Oh my, that was quite a, care, quite a chore. You, got a, you had the white potato vines that grew up about eight inches, nine inches tall. And you had these potato bugs that would eat the leaves. So you had to pick them all. You didn't have anything to spray on them then to kill them. So you had to do it by hand. So you got a little tin can and filled it with some kerosene. And you, and you went down the row and you leaned down and you picked up the potato bugs and put them in the little can. And that killed them. Now that was a laborious job. That sounds very labor intensive. Another thing that was hard to do in the early spring, you planted potatoes and you had to cut the potatoes first and in each little piece you had to eat, leave an eye because that's where the little plant started. And when you planted them, you planted them in a hole, but the eye had to be up so the little plant would grow well. So that was laborious too. Mm. Then when the it's strawberry time. Oh my, that was a that was a bad time. A bad time? A bad time because you worked from morning till night. Mm. First you went down the row and bending over. Then you'd get tired. And then you would get down on your knees. Mm. And then you would get down on your elbow. And then you would get to start all over again. Oh my. Worked hours from sun up to sundown. How, how early would you uh, get up? I mean, would you get up before the oh, sun rose and get no, out of the field? No, in, in that time of the year, it was pretty early. You know, okay. you get up five or six o'clock, but it would be light. Did you do this from the time you were 11 or? Yes, I began then. And we were lucky if we, if we picked, they were little quart boxes. And if you picked 100, you were really lucky from one day. Now, first of all, you, it made two cents when you picked a bucket, a, a carton, and then it got to be three cents, and you could get, you could win, you could make three dollars a day. Oh. Man, that was rich then. Well, what would you do with that money? Was there a store? Oh, I would no, I would keep it and and put it away and buy something I wanted, like for Christmas or a gift or you know something like that. Sure. Those... So the cucumbers were hard to pick because the vines were rough. 
and they would mm -hmm. stick in your fingers, you know, bother you. And, uh, and the sweet potatoes were, had vines, and you had to turn the vines over so the cultivator could get down the row. And then you had to turn the vines back so the cultivator could get down the other side of the row. So, and, and we had to stack, I helped to stack hay. Mm. And uh, that was nice because it was fun to get up on a, on a uh, wagon and, uh, and pack the hay down with your feet and not fall off. Mm. So you'd have to balance up on top of loose hay on a wagon? <laughs> That's right. My father said I was the best hay packer he ever had. Mm. Of course, he said that to make me work harder. <laughs> it probably worked. It probably did. Well, that sounds like a lot of work. So, so when you moved from what? the city to the country, not only were you moving out to where there were less conveniences, but you were probably working a lot harder. That's right. And as soon as my brother got up a little bit older, he had to work too. Mm. So, um, and you did not have any obese children. <laughs> I guess and not. And you did not have any obese grown people that worked on a farm. It was too hard. I'm sure. Yeah. And when you would pick all of these uh, truck crops, what would you do with them? Was there a, a market in the Oh, window? yes. Um, the, the strawberries, for instance, uh, the, the little boxes would hold a quart. And you'd put them in a crate of 32 then. I think now they put them in crates of 16 maybe. But then you had a crate of 32. And then you would haul them to, uh, well, we hauled ours to Pittsville where they had an auction. And you, they would auction off your strawberries. Okay. And would, you, would the other crops go to Pittsville as well when you would pick them? No. Um, they went to different places, but uh, okay. they was, that was the only place there was an auction. Okay. Now, from, from Wango to get to Pittsville, how, how much time would that take in your cart? Oh, I can't remember that. But with a wagon, excuse me, with a wagon, it took quite a bit of time. Mm. Did you make many trips back and forth between the country and Salisbury? Not, we didn't go very often, no. If, if you did want to go, how long would that have taken? Oh, my. Well, you went with, first you went with horse and buggy. Mm -hmm. And we had a nice horse that named Scott, and he would be hitched up to the buggy. And the buggy would hold two people. Just two people? Just two people. Now, that's what our buggy held anyway. But it would take hours to, to get to Salisbury. In other words, a trip to Salisbury would take a whole day. Mm. And so if you came... There and back in your business that you had to take care of. Would you do shopping in Salisbury? Well, yes, we did some, but we didn't have much need to shop then because you raised everything that you, you grew and canned it. Okay. But you had to buy things like sugar and flour mm. and things like that and coffee, things like that. But there was a general store in Wango. I forgot to mention that. There was a general store named Laws and Hamblin, and you could buy anything there, molasses, anything. Mm. Was it run by a relative of yours? Yes. Okay. It was run by my grandfather and his partner, Mr. Hamblin. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And so other than those staple crop uh, foods like sugar and coffee, you've supplied everything from your farm. Yes. We had from the pig killings, we had meat and lard and cracklings to put in your, in your mm. cornbread. Have you ever heard of cracklings? I have. I've never eaten them. Well, they're, they're very good. They're little um, pieces of fat that are very um, well fried, so as they got their name from crackle, mm. cracklings. And you put them in like cornmeal and make cornbread. Probably doesn't hurt the taste of that one bit, does it? No, it doesn't. It doesn't really. Then we had chickens that we raised on the farm and turkeys mm -hmm. and guineas and what, so what do you do with a guinea? You 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 kill it and dress it like a chicken and roast it like a chicken. Okay. It's very good. It's all dark meat. Oh, so it's and it's small, smaller than a chicken. Okay. So what would you do with meat if you had not finished it in a day? You didn't have a refrigerator, did you? No, but we would have an ice man come by and well, once a week, and we would buy ice and put it in an ice box. And um, 
so and and then my mother canned she canned the meat she canned the tent fried the can tenderloins and canned them fried the sausage and canned that mm. and uh you know we just pretty much got along well now when your mother was doing all of her cooking how was she cooking without uh, gas oh, or electricity? Oh, yes. We had a big range, a kitchen range, big. And it was ran on, um, was heated by wood. Hmm. And uh, it had no gadgets to tell you what the temperature was. It was either hot or cold. Hmm. And, uh, but she got so she could uh, adjust that and make beautiful things like angel food cakes and things. Really? Oh, my mother and grandmother were wonderful cooks. Now, your mother, when she was living on Camden Avenue in Salisbury, she had had a more um, Oh, she had gas stove, yeah. I, I wonder what she thought of moving back out and using this fire Well, stove. I think it was a little hard. Yes. Did she, did she ever talk to you about it? Or? No, she never did. She might have talked to my father. I don't know. <laughs> I Probably. suspect. So, so then when you were in eighth grade, you moved back to Salisbury to, yes, right. to board with a, a relative of yours. Yeah. And at that time, then you went to which high school did you go Wicomico to? Wicomico High School, and it was on Upton Street then, uh, where the original um, uh, Daily Times building is okay. across from the hospital. Okay. So, so that's that where the That was called school. Upton Street then. Okay. And so how would you get to school then? Would you, was there a bus service or? No, I had walked. It was about, I walked from East Church Street over to Upton, up to uh, uh, each day, back and forth, walked. Hmm. And how many students were in your graduating class? Um, it, it was a, a rather large school for that time of, of date, for that date. Uh, I think there were maybe 90 in my class. And. So those must have been students from all around Wicomico yes, County. Yes, they were. Uh -huh. Did most of them board like you did? I don't know. Uh, I know a, a lot of them um, did. A lot of them walked to school. Uh -huh. I don't know about the others. Okay. And how often were you able to get back home when you were here? Almost every weekend, my mother or father would come and pick me up. Now, by that time... We had a, a car, a Ford. Okay, what kind of Ford did you have? That was a Model T. And let me tell you about Model Ts. Model Ts were wonderful, but they were very different from the cars today. There were no windows. There was, of course, a windshield. There were wide fenders, wide uh, uh, lights, big, great big lights. Uh, there were small tires with no air in them, a little bigger than a bicycle tire, but not much. And um, it, the car ran by, well, uh, there was a magneto, and that adjusted how much gas you put in, how much gas you used. So somebody sat in the, in the driver's seat to handle the magneto and somebody got in front of the car with a crank and cranked up the car to start the engine. Now, sometimes the crank would hit, hit back and you would be have a broken arm, I've mm. heard, mm. but you had to be very careful. But those were the Model Ts. And so did you ever have to crank it? No, never. Oh, that's good. We always got a good, strong man to crank <laughs> it. <laughs> so so did, did you learn how to drive on the yes, Model Ts? Yes, I did. Yep. I don't suppose it had power steering or brakes. Oh, did it? it did not. No, it was it was hard. And of course, the roads then were all dirt, you know, mud, mm -hmm. snowy, icy, wet in the summer too. Mm -hmm. And but, these tires would just sink right down in the mud, you know. So a lot of times you would get stuck. Mm. Was it better or worse than riding in a horse buggy? Well, it was faster. And yes, I guess it was better, really. Okay. So, so it didn't get stuck any more than a horse buggy would have, do you think? No, the buggy didn't get stuck because it was pulled by a horse. Okay. And we didn't have any trouble with that. But with the, with the cars, I remember when the uh, Model A's came in, the Model A's in, uh, later on had windows in, instead of, 
at first, cars had a like a curtain that would go around with um, spaces in between for eyes and glass so you could see out. And you would clip that on if you thought it was going to be raining. Mm. And uh, so that worked well. But then I remember when my mother and father were talking about windows in cars will never work. Mm. I mean, that was <laughs> just so revolutionary to have windows in a car. I'm sure. And then I, I want to tell you about another thing that that um, I I rode around in, and that was a uh, a little car with a, uh, a a little back seat open, and you had to get up and into the back seat. Hmm. So that was that was funny too. Is it one of those little jump seats in the back? No, it was no lit, no no cover on it at all. Just really? open. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. So come rain or shine, you were yeah. you were in it. Yeah, that's right. Mm. So after you finished up high school, then you were uh, you went straight away to the Salisbury Normal School. That's right. In 29, 1929 to nineteen thirty one, two years, I got a teacher certificate. Okay. And uh, the Normal School then was so different from the way it is now. Um, there was only a north uh, part of the school, a north section. There was no middle section, just a north section. And in that two-story, on the second story were the dorms where the students stayed. And I know my class had 66 people in it. And um, the, um, at the northern end was a library. And beyond that, back of that, was a um, little theater, and the and the emphasis is on little, mm. a little stage and a little few seats. Beyond that was a campus school, and it had three grades, three teachers, and that's where we students went to observe, and pra and then practice teach. Mm. We learn how to practice teach. And um, guess where the the um, dining room was? Where? In the basement. Really? Yep. Now, after teaching in Anne Arundel County, I, I quit. I got a, a leave of absence. And I wanted to get my degree, my bachelor's degree. So in 37, I went back to the college. Now, by that time, there had been a building uh, carried on, which there was a center part of the, of the beautiful entrance, mm -hmm. Holloway Hall, and the um, um, that was three stories, and the mm -hmm. dorms were on the third floor then. Okay. And then on the uh, east, uh, south side of the, um, of the entrance was the beautiful social room. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that was what was our dining room then, a beautiful paneled room. And that's now called the Great Hall, that dining room. Oh, uh-huh, yeah. yes. I've been to some parties there. Yes. And um, beyond that was a big kitchen. Mm. So it was had changed so much. Now, I remember when I was first there that this little building that I was in was surrounded by cornfields. <laughs> and around. there's a picture I had once, I don't have it now, but with a man plowing or cultivating in a cornfield. All around where the school building That's was. That's right. So, so you went to the Salisbury Normal School in only a small portion of what's now Holloway Hall. That's right. And they must have been doing construction while you were in school. Oh, they, they were. See, I finished in 31. And then I went back in 37. Mm -hmm. So in that, in that space of time, the building had, had changed to what the main building is now. So there, there was a, they started the school right up and they didn't wait for the building really to be finished. As soon as it was large enough to serve their purposes, they were able to start the school. Yeah, and just think what it looks like now. Mm. Now, what was the 
attitude of the people in the community toward this new school going up? Oh, they, they wanted it. They, they thought it was a great thing. Now, of course, you know, it was built in the Depression. Mm -hmm. And it was a great thing for the, for the community and for the, the whole area of the Eastern Shore. And at that time, what other opportunities would you have had to go to college? I wouldn't. I wouldn't have been able to. It was a great benefit to the children, on the, to the students on the Eastern Shore. Right. Had either of your parents been to college? No. My mother was graduated from high school and she wanted to go to college, but her father wanted his, he had two girls, wanted his girls to stay home, so mm -hmm. she never got a chance to go and she wanted to go so much. My father was, uh, was not graduated from high school. He went to elementary school. Mm -hmm. My uncle was um, one of the six children and that was the second family of the Laws family and he went to West Point, so he was quite a, um, a notable character uh, in, the, in the area. Absolutely, he would have been, and, yeah. and he got, so he got far off of the Eastern Shore. I think he was graduated in uh, 1898. Mm. Right at the Spanish-American War That's then. right, and he was in that. Mm. Did he come back home? He went, up, uh, he went up the hill, what was the name of that hill? That San Juan Hill. San Juan Hill. He went up San Juan Hill too, hmm. right, right, be, right behind the Rough Riders. Did Did he come back often to the Eastern Shore and tell stories? Yes, yes, he did. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, so when you finished up at the your first teaching certificate in 1931, that's when you moved to Anne Arundel County to uh -huh. teach. Uh huh. I went there and boarded and taught in Linthicum Heights Elementary School first grade. Okay, and you did that for six years? I did that, uh-huh, and then I stopped and uh, got a leave of absence and, and got my uh, two-year degree, and while I was getting it to pay for my time there, my tuition, I was Miss Ruth Powell's assistant social director. Okay. And did I mention it was a job? Because it was a job. Mm. <laughs> I worked hard. She kept you busy. Oh my, yes. She was a wonderful person. And what sort of things were you responsible for doing? I was responsible for uh, seeing that the, that the kids behaved at night, for instance, the young people. I was only six years older than they were, so it was a little difficult. <laughs> I'm sure. But six years makes a big difference when That's you're 18 right. and 24. And I went to things, uh, I joined things like uh, the, the Glee Club and, and clubs like that so I could be with the students. And every night we would have dancing in the gym and I was in there with the, with the students dancing too. Hmm. And uh, I relieved Miss Ruth Powell sometimes so she could have a little time off in the office. Hmm. So uh, in, uh, in addition to that, I was studying two years to get my degree. And were all of the students women still at that time? Now, at the first, in the normal school, yes. But n when I went back, we had men students. So at the dances, you had men and women both? Yes. And were all of the people there doing education as they're studying? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, but my brother, for instance, went there for the first two years and then uh, went to University of Maryland uh, and um, entered there and finished up there and then got a law degree. So people could so go there for that their beginning They could years. go there for the basics, yes. Okay, and when you, when you graduated the second time from Salisbury, about how many students were there at the school, would you say? Oh, I can't remember that. But uh, by that time, there were four years, of course. Mm -hmm. So that made a big difference. I'm sure it would. Now, at this time, you didn't have to have a four-year degree to teach because you had already been teaching after your first... That's right. I taught uh, six years in Anne Arundel County after I got my two-year degree from normal school. And then I decided I wanted to, you know, um, get my bachelor's. So I went back to Salisbury, uh, and by that time, it was Salisbury Teachers College. And it was a four-year college, and... Um, I finished in uh, 39, went there in 37, and finished in 39. 
And then did you go back to Anne Arundel County? Then I went back to Anne Arundel County and taught a few years. And I was a supervisor in Anne Arundel County for two years. And then I, the war was going on and my brother was overseas and my parents were getting more old, more aging. And I decided I would try to get a job near them. And so I got a job in, in Worcester County as a supervisor for four years and um, lived at home. And um, I got married in 1946 and to George Engel, and he was from Pennsylvania, and I met him during the war. And uh, we had two children, a boy, a girl and a boy. And I was out 13 years raising the children and working at home. And um, after that, in 62, I began teaching again. And instead of being a supervisor, I went back as a fourth grade teacher. Mm and finished up in 75, retired in 75. And I forgot to say that after I finished my degree at Salisbury Teachers College, I went to Columbia University for four summers and got my bachelor's degree, I mean my master's degree. And that's probably the most famous university for education yeah, in the country. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful university. And I had a wonderful time those summers and visiting, you know, um, um, wonderful plays. And you could go to a play for a dollar if you sat in the top balcony. Was this on Broadway? This was on Broadway. Hmm. But you only, I only saw the top of the, of the actors' heads, but, you know, I heard the music and all. Right, you couldn't <laughs> complain for a dollar. I couldn't complain. Right, and so then after 1975, you retired. Yes. And all of this time you had continued to live in Wango in your That's family's right. home. And then you and um, your husband, was he also retired at this time? Uh, he retired in 1970. Okay. And, and then you told me that you cared for your, for your mother. My husband and I, with some AIDS, cared for my mother until 83. And she was 103 then. Mm. And she was active and... Uh, uh, had um, her intelligence and memories right up to that time. She was only sick really 10 days. Mm. You have very good genes then. Well, my, yes, thank you. And so then after your mother passed away, you said that you and your husband spent, I think, a few years traveling around the world. Yes, my children were through college by that time, and we had no really... Um, with our farm was rented. We still lived at the farm, and we did live there until we moved here in 99. And here is in Salisbury on yeah. Riverside Drive. Yeah. And um, so, um, where was I? Well, so that's, <laughs> I think that gives us the outline of what you did for the, yeah. the rest of those years. But now I want to go back to the, to the Depression. Yes, that, that was a hard time. What was it like to, so in 1931, you got your first job in Anne Arundel yeah, County. That's right. In the middle of the Depression. That's right. It, it, was, it was very difficult. Um, uh, there were so many people there to work and so many sad stories that you heard. And um, it, the food was scarce. And But the, when I was at the farm during the Depression, that wasn't a problem. The food wasn't a problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, later on, when I was in Anne Arundel County, it was. Now, um, when I went back to, to teach there, uh, my brother was in law school, and so he and I rented an upstairs uh, in a family home and had an apartment there. Mm. And I paid for his food and uh, his travel on a little WBNA which was a little electric train that went from Washington and Baltimore and Annapolis. And, um, and when we were, it, this was during the Depression, and we had, uh, sometimes we didn't know just where the next thing was coming from, the next money, because we weren't paid hmm. when we thought we would be paid. So we you never were, knew when the check was going to come. Even working for the school Even system. working for the Board of Education in Anne Arundel County, we didn't know. 
So one time the check came and oh, it was a, it was a big day when that came. Mm. And we were so hungry for meat that um, I said, boy, I said, when we get this check, when now we've got this check, we're going to have meatloaf. So we went to the little market nearby and even beef was scarce in, even if you had money to buy it. Mm. But we bought three pounds of, of hamburger and I made a meatloaf. That must have been a large meatloaf. Oh, it was a large meatloaf for two people. But <laughs> oh my, we enjoyed it so much the first night. And the second night it was pretty good. <laughs> the third night it was not as good. <laughs> And the fourth night, we didn't ever want meatloaf for years. <laughs> I can imagine so, but you had to eat it all. That's right. Mm. Now, were there other ways that the Depression affected you in your own life? Were you, did you have, um, was it more difficult to get back home or in other ways? Yes. Now, there was no bridge then mm -hmm. across the bay. And we had, a, had to meet a ferry, Mattapique Ferry, and, dry, and, and then drive home from that. And uh, I know one time my brother w told me that he needed a dollar because he was going to have a test at, the, uh, at law school and he needed a pony. Now a pony is a kind of a thing that the law, that you study before you take a test. So he said this pony was very important. And I said, how much does it cost? And he says, one dollar. I said, well, I don't know, but I'll look around and maybe I can find a dollar. So I did. I mean, money was scarce. You couldn't, you mm. couldn't even, if you had money in the bank, you couldn't get it out. Mm. And so I looked around and I found a dollar, gave it to him. So he took it gratefully, going to buy his pony. So he went, uh, the next night he came home, then afternoon he came home, and I said, well, I guess you got your pony. He says, pony? He had forgotten. He sa I said, what did you do with that dollar? <laughs> he says, I took a girlfriend to the movies. Oh, no. That <laughs> <laughs> day. Oh, my goodness. I bet you felt real good about that. Oh, I, I did. We laughed about that. Oh, my. Now, when you were... Living there, uh, you, I think you said Linthicum Heights? Uh-huh. Were there... And then I lived in Glen Burnie. Okay. Did you get into the city of Baltimore very often? Yes. On this little WBNA electric train, I would get in on the weekends. Okay. And I could go to matinees and I could shop mm -hmm. when I had money. And I could get, uh, could go to Shraff's and get a hot fudge sundae. Mm. Oh, that was good. I imagine so. Better than meatloaf, anyway. <laughs> I say better than that. And so one time, or one thing that I often talk about with my students is they they wonder in the depression if people were always sad. But it sounds like in Baltimore you could still enjoy yourself and yeah. have a good time. You just you just didn't have much money. You just had to spend it frugally and uh, decide which was a more important thing you wanted to to use it for. Sure. Now, do you remember, um, did you vote in the 1932 election? Or would you have been old enough yet to, to vote then? In uh, 32, let's see, I was born, I would be, I would be uh, 21, yeah. Okay. Do you remember when Franklin Roosevelt uh, was inaugurated? I sure do. Mm. Did you listen to the radio or? Oh, yes. And to hear his talks, oh, it was wonderful. And oh, that reminds me, uh, that, you know, when that was going on in 32, we didn't have electricity out at the farm. Mm. And we had this little uh, machine called a Delco that made 32 volt electricity. We, have a little, we had a little house and it was called the Delco house. And this machine ran by gasoline, little a little um, um, motor, little generator. And it would it would um, get the batteries, you know, charged, and we could have a, a little radio. Now that was the only thing besides the lights that we had. We didn't have any refrigerator or anything else, but we did have a little radio, and we did have dim lights. The house was uh, mm -hmm. wired for electricity, 
and we had electric lights, but we didn't have the high power mm -hmm. until 1946. And that's what we called it then, the high power. Okay, so 1946 is when the high power reached the farm. That's right. Mm. But, so before that, how many of your neighbors would have had a Delco house or a generator? Nobody that I know in the neighborhood had one. So that was a, a luxury then to be able now to have Now my father was not mechanical. He could grow anything. He was a wonderful farmer. But my mother was the one who had to always start the Delco. Hmm. So the lights would get a little dim and we'd all, all say, Mom, go start the Delco. <laughs> <laughs> and so I guess then it would charge batteries. It would charge the batteries. Okay. And then they had these big containers, and the battery would, you could tell if it was down besides the, the uh, strength of the light, because the bulb, that little white bulb that would go to the top when it was, I think there were about six or eight great big batteries. Mm. Now, what was it like during World War II? You spent most of that time back in Salisbury, or in Wongo, didn't you? Uh, in World War II, no. I was in Anne Arundel County, too, okay. at that time. Okay. And uh, I sorted rivets and to help the war effort. And I, uh, the, the teachers and I uh, registered some of the soldiers, hmm. took information about that. When I went home in the summer, I spotted airplanes. Really? Now, we had a little, a little building about as big as, a little bigger than a, um, a telephone um, uh, um, that you have at, at, in the um, a telephone, telephone uh, booth. booth. Mm -hmm. About a little bigger than that with a little uh, platform in there, a little table and a little radio and we spotted airplanes in Wongo. And so were you looking for uh, German airplanes? Yes. Did you ever see any? No. But that's what we were looking for because, you know, there was a danger that, you know, we would be have enemies come over here. Sure, and there were submarines that were off that's the coast. That's right. So what years were you looking, uh, doing the spotting? I, I can't remember what years, but it was at the farm. Okay. and. Then you also said you sorted rivets? I sorted rivets. What now was that, that was in Anne Arundel County. Um, Glen Martin was a place that, that was uh, in the war effort to uh, build airplanes, excuse me, in Baltimore. And um, they had, uh, they, you, the teachers or anybody that wanted to could get a bag, a ba a ba like a 15 pound bag of rivets that were all mixed up. Hmm. And you had to sort them out. Into different sizes, I Into different sizes, yeah. And so would you do that just in the evening uh -huh. after your work day? Yeah, after I finished teaching, I would do that. Hmm. And <coughs> what other sorts of changes did you notice in, during the wartime? Uh, the the uh, teachers were so scarce. Um, we would have, in Anne Arundel County, we would have people that were, had just graduated from high school teaching with no experience at all hmm. and uh, so it was it was a rough time and um, when I went back to Anne Arundel, when I went back to Worcester County in 44 it was like heaven there because they didn't have all that the problem hmm. that they had in Anne Arundel County we had experienced teachers and I just enjoyed my work so much as supervisor. I'm sure you did. And it was probably good to be back home, too. Yeah, it was. Now, at that time, there was a labor shortage for the agricultural um, crop harvest, too. Did you ever see any of that in Worcester or Wicomico County? No, I never did. Okay, so it wasn't a, a problem for your family? No, your not, not for me. Uh-uh. Now, how did you meet your husband, this Pennsylvania oh, that's, fellow? Oh, that's an interesting story. This was a war romance, and I was teaching in Anne Arundel County, and my brother was, was uh, ready to go in uh, overseas. He was getting trained. He and my husband were, happened to be in the same area in Atlantic City being trained, and they became friends. Hmm. And so he brought him down to Anne Arundel County for a weekend, and uh, that's how we met. Now, this was right after the training, but before they had been shipped That's out. That's right. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And so then it, it, it continued, and finally my brother was sent overseas on D-Day, and uh, my husband was older, and he was sent to California to, to work in the Army, mm -hmm. but he did, wasn't sent overseas. So then we communicated by letter across the country, and then uh, when he got out of the, uh, of the Army, he proposed, and I said I had no post-war plans, so we got married. <laughs> he asked me, do you have any post-war plans? That was his proposal. Oh, my goodness. I said, not really. So he says, let's get married. Mm. So we did. And then he moved down here from and Pennsylvania. And then he moved down here, got a job in Worcester County as a high school teacher. Mm. And, and then how, how many years were you married? Uh, what would we say a while ago? 57. 57 Almost years. 57 years. Hmm. So I guess your, your brother paid you back for that dollar that he wasted. when he I had, think so. Yeah, introducing yeah, you to I your husband. So. Very good. Now, uh, there are many other things about your life that are interesting, but we, we haven't talked at all about your, your church yet. No, I would love to talk about that. And so you're, you're a member of the Salisbury uh, Old School Baptist Church for many, oh, yes. many years. I was a member of Salisbury Old School Baptist Church. And uh, because of declining membership and elderly membership, um, poor parking uh, uh, places, we decided, we members decided to sell the church regretfully, but we felt it would, had to be done. This was about three years ago. Yes. And so we uh, contacted Forest Grove membership, Forest Grove uh, Old School Baptist Church, and asked if we could join them, and they graciously said yes. So we became a joint member with that, and now the church is known as Forest Grove Salisbury Old School Baptist Church. Okay. And um, we have, uh, after we did that, uh, we hired a, um, um, a person to make plans, an architect to make plans, and we built an addition to the original building. And it's a very nice addition indeed. We built, uh, we have a new, two new um, entrances on the side with a beautiful ramp uh, we have a uh, lovely dining room, a well-equipped kitchen, new bathrooms and storage rooms, and um, it's, it's a very nice facility, and we're so proud of it. And as I said, it's called Forest Grove Salisbury Old School Baptist Church, and it's on Forest Grove in Parsonsburg. That's right, just right we out of town. We have a, a dedicated and gifted pastor, that's Elder Elbert Robbins from Salisbury. And now how long have you been a member of the Old School Baptist Church? <laughs> you know, I can't remember that. A long time. Have you been going all of your life? I've been going all my life from a little girl, but I was reluctant to join. Mm -hmm. So it's been maybe 15 years. I've, I've not been okay. a long-term member. Okay, but... You grew up with the church. I grew up from the from the littlest kid. I had to go to church. I had to. Mm -hmm. That's the way I felt then, of course. Mm -hmm. What were meetings like back in those oh, days? Oh, my goodness. They were long and in the summer hot <laughs> and in the winter cold. <laughs> and we had um, but such a big membership. And so many people came to the church. Hundreds of people came to the church. We had um, yearly meetings, which, and then we had a three-day uh, association in which we fed people from morning to night, I think. Mm. And a lot of times we would have people stay over for a week at the, at the farm, you know. So it was, it was really, really a lovely experience. Mm. But... Um, we don't have those those crowds now that we had then, oh. but um, we have a, a lovely membership and some very good friends that uh, job uh, attend our church. Now, in addition to the to the church, when you didn't have these association weekends, 
Did you ever get over to Ocean City? Oh, yes. We had a, a apartments over in Ocean City to rent. And we had, they were on the boardwalk. And um, the last ones we had were at 13th Street in the boardwalk called the Coronet and the Coronet South. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were 10 of them. We sold them in 1980. Now, a terrible tragedy happened in Ocean City. In 1962 was a big storm on March the 4th and the 5th and Ocean City was devastated. I have pictures of, the, of that storm. Um, our building, the Carnet, was devastated to the extent that two bottom apartments were completely filled with sand and boardwalk. Mm. Absolutely everything gone from them. And the, there was a stairway from the second and third, uh, from the uh, second to the third floor and it was all the porches were taken off by the storm mm. and the stairway was still standing there sticking out. Mm. That's one of the famous pictures in the 1962 storm. Mm. Um, the the um, sand came over in just unbelievable amounts. Our, our parking lot in the back, the sand came up to the second floor porch and it had to be moved out by bulldozers. Hmm. And the um, the uh, front of the of the of the uh, in our building was full of sand, and that had to be taken out by wheelbarrow because hmm. we couldn't get any machines in. So that was a terrible time, and that's just one one place, and the whole town was devastated. Hmm. Now, how long have you've been going to Ocean City? Can you remember the first time you might have gone? or I don't remember the first time I've been, but I remember that it was 1950 that we moved there uh, for the summers. Mm. What was Ocean City like in 1950? My, it, was, it was so different and even more different when I was graduating from high school. Um, one time, four of us played hooky from school in the, in the 12th grade, and we went in a little car to Ocean City mm. in the afternoon. And we went down the, down the beach and got stuck. Now, Ocean City stopped then, all the buildings, at 13th Street. 13th Street? 13th Street. And beyond that was a uh, Catholic home and uh, just sand. Hmm. And so we got stuck in the sand and um, had to, you know, convince our parents that, you know, we wouldn't do it again. How did you get out? I mean, it's stuck oh, up that, in... I don't remember that. But I remember that the two men, the two boys, you know, did something and got us out. Okay. And so you were able to make it I back. can't remember if we got help or not. So you said that was right around when you were finished with high school. Yeah. So what year would that have been? 29. Now, there wasn't a bridge, was there? No, the bridge didn't come until 52. So how would you get across Ocean City in your car? Oh, oh, the bridge, that, that bridge was there. I thought you meant the Bay Bridge. No, 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 I, no so there was a bridge for your car then to oh, get no, Ocean the, City. We had the, uh, a um, railroad bridge and a passenger bridge. Okay, so you could drive the over car. and that way you could get yourself stuck. Yeah. Mm. Now, what other sorts of changes. By, so between 1929 and 1950, I assume there were houses quite a bit further than 13th Street. Oh, yes. Yes, because when we built, when we had our place in 1962, we went up to 13th Street. In 1962, it was way out. The Beach Plaza was on the other, other side of 13th Street, and so they, there were a lot of buildings um, farther north. And so would you... S now, in 33 was that when the uh, um, inlet was cut with that storm. Mm -hmm, with that hurricane. Yeah. And so you saw Ocean City before the inlet was there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was it like to live there through the summer? Was it uh, the kind of vacation place that it is now with lots of people from other places oh, yeah. coming? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was, and it was... 
more relaxing then. You know, now it's so crowded mm. and so much traffic. Mm. But then it wasn't uh, that much. And of course, we had a business that we were running, so we were busy. But uh, there were so many advantages for the children to be on the beach, you know, and mm. they loved it because they were pretty isolated in the winter with uh, being on the farm, you know. There was a lot of things they couldn't participate in mm. uh, because we were 13 miles from, from the school. So they enjoyed Ocean City, and uh, George and I did too, and Mother did too. When did they have the amusement park in Ocean City? Well, that was there um, early on. I don't remember, uh, but uh, Trimper's was the amusement park hmm. uh, owner, Trimper. So children there could play on the beach, they, they could go to the amusement park, they could yeah. ride the rides? Yeah. Did they, did they have all of the candies they have now? Yeah, they had, uh, yeah, they had saltwater taffy and yeah. I imagine that was good fun. It was. They enjoyed it. Now, with your teaching in, in Snow Hill, I believe it was Snow Hill that you were teaching at in Worcester uh -huh. County. So you began teaching there again after you had stopped in 62. to have your children. In 62. Uh-huh. Okay. So you were at Snow Hill when the Snow Hill schools went through integration. Yes. How did that work in Worcester County and in Snow Hill? Well, it seemed to work very, very smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, I recall that we had uh, one um, African-American teacher and one um, in my room and in the other rooms, I had one student. Mm -hmm. And uh, the student was a little girl and she was quite advanced and very nice. Um, I know one teacher quit because of this in the high school. Mm -hmm. She didn't approve of it, and so she quit. And I know that another teacher in my school had a husband so um, against it that she quit. But other than that, it was very smooth. Hmm. That's good. Were you, um, w I assume, well aware of what was happening up in Cambridge and the sorts of contra or conflicts that had been there just right up the shore. Yeah. But Snow Hill was able to escape most of yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being willing to talk with us today again and for, for going through some of your experiences on the Eastern Shore. We appreciate your time. It was good to talk with well, you. Well, I was glad to do it. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm.